Thank you everyone for coming back, for those who came back, and welcome to those who just joined. Um, um, I, we had another workshop, so we were just in the same room, so I literally just had 20 minutes between to go grab some water. Um, I'm going to talk about Ray today. Uh, it's going to be a very basic introduction to Ray. Um, I'm going to show you a little bit how it works. Um, hopefully, this will just give you enough knowledge so you can go and expand kind of your, your knowledge about Ray itself. Uh, before I get started, how many people here have used Kubernetes before? Most of you. How many people here have heard or used Ray before? Few people. Okay, cool, cool. All right. So for those of you who have used Ray before, it's not going to be advanced. It's going to be very basic and going to be focused on Ray on Kubernetes because Ray is, you can run Ray in a lot of other environments, but specifically Kubernetes environment is what we're going to focus on today. My name is Abdel. I'm a developer advocate at Google. I co-host a podcast called the Kubernetes Podcast by Google. I don't, anybody here listening? Oh, few of you. Okay, cool. I will give the others time to go. I'm just kidding. Um, I, uh, so I mostly work on Kubernetes, hence my t-shirt. But um, Ray have been um, a, a framework which have been rising in popularity for AI and ML workloads since the boom of LLMs. And since the Ray operator itself, or the cube operator for Ray, have been op open sourced, that's why I started being very interested because among other companies, Google is one of the companies that is focusing quite a lot on this, that operator and making sure that, that our platform can run the operator properly. Um, AI is all over, around us. Um, it's the reason why we are here in Paris this week. Uh, all the companies that you see their logo on this slide actually contribute to Ray or use Ray internally. Um, and those machine learning models we're using are just getting bigger and bigger in terms of capabilities. And typically, people who have been doing data science before data science became cool, and for those who have been doing machine learning before LLMs, one of the most common challenges, if you want, is the fact that when you do machine learning models, in the entire life cycle of your building the model, you are using multiple tools. You are using multiple different type of, of frameworks, programming languages, tools, which are tools that are specifically designed to do one specific task. You might use tools for uh, preparing the data, training, fine-tuning, serving, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, Ray was introduced as a way to create a unified AI platform using one tool alone to do everything you need to do when you're building machine learning models. And it's based on a concept of a core and libraries, and then the integration toward infrastructure is up to the cloud providers to do. And I'm going to talk about that in a bit. So in Ray itself, you have the core part of it, which is the framework. It's written in Python. Then you have libraries, and you can see the list of the libraries here. You have Ray Data for uh, data preparation, Ray Train for tu uh, uh, training, Ray Tune for tuning, uh, and Ray Serve for serving. And so those libraries are split explicitly this way, so that even if you are using Ray to do the entire life cycle of your machine learning model, you can import the libraries based on what exactly do you, need, you need to do, right? So if you're writing just training code, you don't need all the other libraries. You can just import the training library, right? And even um, it has a command line tool, a CLI, to be able to interface with Ray. It has an interface like a, a GUI, like a dashboard, to be able to monitor your, two, uh, your jobs and look at the, the training and progress and logs and all this stuff. Then under the hood, uh, uh, because Ray is technically just um, uh, an, a distributed machine learning uh, framework, then once you write jobs in Ray and you need to run them, they need to run somewhere, right? And so that's essentially where the community draws the line, where they say the integration part that decides where Ray itself runs is up to the different cloud providers to do. And so today there are integrations to be able to run Ray on just regular standard virtual machines on any cloud providers you want. I'm going to talk a little bit about the architecture of Ray in a bit. Um, uh, and then you can also run it on top of Kubernetes, which is what we're going to look at today. So it's an open source unified platform written in Python. Um, uh, it's meant for people who doesn't really have that much experience with distributed workloads. So it makes distributed workloads very easy. It handles orchestration, it handles scheduling, tolerance, auto scaling, retries, all that stuff for you. Um, and, and so that, that's, that, that's essentially this like kind of three layer split I talked about. There is the core libraries or the core framework, there is the Ray AI libraries, and then there is the cloud uh, integrations. So the, the community maintains the, to, the two top uh, layers, and then the bottom layer, it's up to each cloud provider, whatever you want to call it. So today, you can run, run Ray on Google Cloud, you can run it on Azure, you can run it on AWS, both on VMs and Kubernetes, and then you can also just run it on any random standard Kubernetes server somewhere, or Kubernetes cluster. 
So I talked about this concept of libraries. Um, you have libraries for training, uh, serving, fine tuning, uh, doing uh, reinforcement learning, and, and serving the model itself. Um, and uh, the whole point is being a standard single tool that you could learn to do in the entire life cycle, life cycle of machine learning, and then um, uh, use it also to run your, your, your workloads. So here is a very simple example. These are just two random Python libraries for those of people who run, uh, who write Python code. Basically, you just add an annotation called at ray.remote, and that turns those functions into what, what Ray called tasks. So once you annotate the functions this way, and you use Python to run the library, if you have a local Ray cluster, then your functions will be executed remotely on the cluster. They will not be executed uh, locally, right? Um, so this is just a very simple example. This is one of my favorite things about Ray, is the fact that you can actually um, uh, call a function that call functions. This is just an example where I have a function called read array, and then a function that's called, this is called add. So I can instantiate read array to read one file. I can instantiate a second one to add in a second file. And then I, I can just call the add.remote function and put as two inputs the variables, which are the, the two functions before. And if you write code this way, Ray will know that this function, ID, ID1 and ID2, has to be executed first. So it will execute this first function, execute the second one, and then the output of these two will be sent to the add.remote function to be able to, 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 to execute that one. And so this is an example of how distributed uh, workloads work. So if you have a Ray cluster, those ID1 and ID2 could be distributed into different nodes and executed on two separate nodes, right? And this is a very typical machine learning problem where you have to like read very, very long files, so, like, like load a lot of data from a file. So you can just parallelize uh, those like computations across multiple nodes. Um, then if you have Ray class, uh, sorry, Python classes and you annotate them, they are called actors. It's just terminology that Ray uses. Um, so this is just for you to, if you go look at the dashboards later and you look at an actor, you know that the actor is basically just a Python class and that a task is just a Python function. Um, one of the things you could do also is you could add uh, some inputs to the Ray remote annotation. This is an example where I can say, I want to run this function, but I want to run it with a GPU. Um, so I want to run it with one single GPU as an input, and this will essentially prompt the framework to schedule the workload on top of a node that has a GPU available. And I'm going to talk about some uh, examples later. So this is the Ray architecture. If you look at it, it will look slightly similar to how Kubernetes work in the sense that in Ray world, it's called Raylet. And in Kubernetes world, it's called a kubelet. So a Raylet is essentially a component that runs on top of a worker node that connects to the control plane of Ray, which Ray called head node. So head node is literally just a control plane. That's where the, the API that you talk to uh, to be able to execute the workloads runs. That's what, the, that's what runs the scheduler. That's what runs the orchestrator and all these components. And then on the nodes, you will have a scheduler and you will have a Raylet, which talks to the head node and receives job requests and executes them. And then there is a component called the C, um, uh, G, GCS, which is a global control store. That's essentially if you are running a calculation uh, and you need to connect to a remote blob store to be able to download data, the GCS has all these integrations. So it, it, it uses Fuse, if you, are using to, uh, if you are familiar with the concept of Fuse. So Fuse is a driver, a Linux driver, that allows you to mount a blob store to an, a Linux node and make it look like a file system. So if you are using something like S3 or um, uh, um, AWS, uh, Google, uh, Google Cloud Storage or Azure Blob Store, you can use Fuse as a driver to mount a bucket into a node so you can access the files in the node like you're accessing them in a file system. And GCS the, or the Global Control Store in Ray has integration with Fuse. So you could just literally write a function, the Ray will schedule the function on one of the node and it will use the local object store to mount that, that bucket so you can download the data and, and do all the processing that you need to do on it. Then on Kubernetes specifically, there is this thing called the kuberay operator, which is an operator that can allow you to run Ray on top of Kubernetes. So it follows the same exact architecture. You will have a head node and you will have one or multiple worker nodes running inside Kubernetes. It just, they run as a pod instead of running as a node, right? And inside that pod, you have all the containers of, of those components, so the Raylet, the GCS, and all that stuff running inside the pod. Um, and then you have the API exposed to you via Kubernetes service, and you can just talk to it. And I'm going to show you an example later. And this way, actually, with the Kubray operator, one of the cool things, what I like it, is it makes it super portable. Because 
ray itself or the cube ray operator is written as a, as a Kubernetes operator. So you can just download it and install it on any Kubernetes cluster you want. It doesn't really matter if you're running on top of AWS, GCP, Azure, your own Kubernetes uh, um, environment. Um, and what, what the cube operator does, or one of the things that cube operator does, is that it allows you to use Ray as a framework to write that high level code and then translates all those into underlying Kubernetes objects, right? So if you're running a job with Ray, then that will create a, 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 an object called job in Kubernetes because job, the Kubernetes API has an object called job. So you would use Ray to write you, your code and then the operator will translate that into uh, Kubernetes objects. Um, so be because Kubernetes itself run or you is, 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 is just a resource orchestrator, there are two types of orchestrations happening when you run Ray on top of the jobs. The, the first layer of orchestration, oh, sorry, when you run Ray on top of Kubernetes, the first layer of orchestration is essentially the running the head node and running the worker nodes on top of Kubernetes as various jobs. And essentially Kubernetes will be in charge for scaling up and scaling down the, the, the Ray cluster, which runs on top of Kubernetes. And then uh, the, 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 the jobs that you are running or the workloads you are running will be orchestrated by Ray itself, right? Then there is these three different components. Uh, they are basically just CRDs, custom resource definitions, that Ray has. So one of them is called the Ray cluster, which allows you to just run a cluster. So those like architecture I showed, the head node and worker nodes, you create a Ray cluster and that translates into running one head node and multiple worker nodes, but they just run as pods inside Kubernetes. Then you have something called the Ray job, which allows you to basically run a job on top of Kubernetes. And then you have something called the Ray service, and that's what allows you to serve a model. So if you, if you, once you train the model and you need to serve it, you create just a simple Ray, a Ray service, and that will run a pod with the serving server, the model on top of it, and present an API to you, right? And the other thing also to keep in mind is because Kubernetes as a resource orchestrator can be used in various ways. And one of those ways is you can basically t tell Kubernetes please schedule this thing for me and then run it on top of a node that has an H100 GPU or a T100 GPU, then you can basically just attach, use the concept of Ray cluster to run a cluster and then run it on top of nodes that have GPUs. And then once you use Ray itself to run your workloads, then they will run on top of a node which already has the GPU in it. Make sense? All right. So why, why Kubernetes specifically? Well, because you can do a lot of fine tuning and scaling of, of, of Ray using the Kubernetes concept. So let me show you a very simple example here. Uh, okay, let me try to not show you my Twitter and show you actually Ray itself. Okay, so I have a, a very simple Kubernetes, uh, sorry, Ray cluster here. Well, I have a Kubernetes cluster running Ray. Um, so if I do kubectl get pods in the proper namespace, Uh, you can see there that I have uh, uh, three, the three bottom uh, uh, pods. So I have a cube operator, which is the actual operator. Then I have a cube uh, head node and then a worker node, right? Um, and so these are created through an object called cube cl array cluster. So if I do array cluster in that namespace, uh, then I have this object here. I can actually, you know, you're, if you're familiar with um, uh, uh, with Kubernetes, you can basically guess where I'm going with this. I can just edit that object. And I can do something like uh, maybe scale it up. So let's see. So you can already see here that I have already said I want four gigabytes of FML storage. I want two gigabytes of memory for my, uh, for my worker nodes. And uh, I think somewhere there's like a, some just environment variables to expose like Ray itself, expose Grafana, expose Prometheus, expose a bunch of things. I have my resource requested limits, like typical Kubernetes stuff. I have, um, so each pod will run uh, four gigabytes. So this is the head node. It runs in, in a node that has uh, eight gigabytes of, of memory. And then if I scroll down somewhere to, it's a pretty long object. Uh, this is worker node. You can see here, for example, I have only one replica. So just for the sake of this exercise, I'm gonna switch this to three. And uh, if I scroll down a little bit more, um, yeah, then it's like more objects and I can see, okay, so my replicas run on top of um, uh, 32 gigabytes of memory. So each of the nodes, uh, the worker nodes themselves, they have 32 gigabytes of memory. Um, so if I do this, um, WQ, and that should just, uh, 
So if I do this, I will have two more uh, nodes coming. And you can see that each, inside each of node, there are like three different containers, right? So one container is the Rayleigh, one container is the uh, uh, global storage, and the third container is just the, the, the worker process. Uh, or like, I think there's some monitoring stuff in there, like Fluent, either, either Fluent Bit or, uh, or, uh, or uh, uh, Prometheus Grafana. But anyway, it doesn't matter. So pretty simple standard stuff. So you would use Kubernetes to orchestrate the Ray cluster itself. And then once Ray is running, then you can use Ray and the Ray API to run your workloads, right? So I can show you an example of how that would look like. Um, uh, Ray exposes quite a lot of APIs with quite a lot of ports, but the most important one is port 8265, which exposes the control plane. So once you have that exposed, you will have a dashboard that looks like this. So this is the dashboard of my cluster, so I can, sorry, I can go here, I can look at the cluster, you can see that it's already, if I get my screen back, <laughs> uh, it has like the Three, two head, uh, one head node and one cluster, one worker cluster here, uh, and the other ones are not there yet. They're coming. They haven't been provisioned yet, right? And what I can do once I have that running, I can just use. So th there is a command line called Ray, literally, which you, I downloaded already, and I can either I can I can basically submit jobs to Ray multiple ways. I could write Python code. Annotate it with the at dot ray remote and then just execute that and that will be executed on top of ray. But then I can also just use the, uh, the client, ray client, to run a job. And that's something that looks like this. Um, ray uh, job submit. So for example, this is, I want submitting a job. I'm using as an address localhost 8265. So that's the port forward I have. And then I'm just literally sending code. So I'm executing in port ray ray.init and then print uh, this like a function called ray.cluster resources, which will print uh, basically information about the ray cluster itself. This is just a very stupid example, but just to show you. So my job have been succeeded uh, successfully. I get logs back, by the way. So this is the output of that function that I executed. And then I can go back here, go into jobs, and then I can see, okay, I have the job here. I can see the, the output of the job. I can see, um, uh, the logs and I can see like whether it was successful not successful and they can do a bunch of things There is also like a like a, a CPU flame graph so I can see how the CPU consumption have been going and and a bunch of other things um, So yeah, so very 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 simple if I would have uh, s Like uh, like a, a model serving then I can have a ray like in this tab I will be able to see what my model is how it's performing and I see a lot of metrics about how my model is doing um, um, so yeah, so basically the, the, the TLDR is that with Kubernetes you are able to orchestrate the Ray cluster itself and then on top of that you use Ray itself to run the workload or to write the code for the workload that you're trying to, to do. Um, it takes advantage of a lot of these built-in orchestration and scheduling mechanisms in Kubernetes. So if you need a GPU, if you need a TPU, uh, if you need accelerators, if you need anything, you could just um, uh, use, use that, like, a, like tell Kubernetes to give you like a node with a GPU or a TPU or something. Um, and if you are running on top of a cloud provider that offers this concept of spot VMs, um, I, I don't know if you know what spot VMs are, but if you don't know, spot VMs are just VMs that is typically a cloud provider spare capacity that they sell to you for cheaper. Uh, so instead of paying a full large VM, you get like a VM for like 80% discount, but you only have it for 24 hours and then the cloud provider takes it back. And if there is still cloud, if there is still availability in the region, you might be able to just claim another one, right? So if you are running a cloud provider that has this, using the auto scaling mechanisms in Kubernetes, you can basically just scale down or scale up if you have a really large job that you're running. You can just tell Ray, run this job, scale up my cluster to like 100 worker nodes, and use a spot VM so it's cheaper to run the, the actual workloads, right? And then it does integrate with quite a lot of tools. Um, so it integrates with Lanchain for j it integrates with Hacking Face. There is this web page called ray.io slash integrations if you are curious about all the possible integrations. I'm just being mindful of the time so I don't go over time. And yes, the, by, by using it on top of Kubernetes, you can more or less achieve this right once run anywhere. Just because Kubernetes, like Ray, uh, or the Ray operator was designed to run on any Kubernetes cluster. So any Kubernetes compatible API will be able to run your Ray um, uh, cluster in there. Um, we do have an example. Uh, I, I will share the GitHub uh, uh, repository later, but there is an example 
where we are using Ray to serve um, a fine-tuned Lama 2 model on top of Kubernetes, and then using Gradio, which is just an interface to, to, to have like a chat interface. So there is like a full example with Terraform that you can basically deploy a, a Kubernetes cluster, deploy Ray, uh, run the model, deploy Gradio, and then uh, load the interface so you can chat with it. And it uses LandChain. If you don't know, LandChain is just a, an open source framework for integrating with LLMs. It's written in Python, and it's basically, it's a framework that was created in such a way that when you are a developer and you need to integrate with an LLM, there are a bunch of tasks that you need to do regardless of which LLM provider you are using. So LandChain 4J provides these core tasks or core functions, and then it has integration with literally most of the, the uh, available uh, uh, LLMs. So it integrates with OpenAI, it integrates with Llama, it integrates with Hugging Face, it integrates with a lot of, of, of other um, uh, uh, um, providers. To give you an example, just to be more concrete, uh, one common thing you need to do if you're a developer, so imagine you are writing an application that people can upload the PDF file and then get a resume of that a PDF file. One task you need to do is extract the text from the PDF file. So there is a function in LandChain which literally you input a PDF file and it gives you back text. And there is also another framework called LandChain 4J, which is a Java version. So this one is in Python and then LandChain 4J is in Java. Anyway, just um, just just a little bit of bantering about lunch for Jay. Thank you. That's all I have. I have, I think, a few minutes if you have any questions for me. Yeah, that's my Twitter or X or whatever you want to call it. And uh, you can find me on LinkedIn with my name. But happy to answer any questions. Yeah, it's literally an LLM inference server. I actually have probably an example. Uh, That's a very good question. I think it uses TGI under the hood, if I'm not mistaken. So it's, it's by default TGI, but I think you can customize it to run any other inference server you want. So the Ray serve is just a, a CRD that allows you to define, um, like deploy a serving model. But then the, under the hood, you can choose whichever inference server you want. Sorry? Cor correct, yes. It's kind of like case server, yes. I think I had an example here of a YAML file, which is um, a, a race, like a race serve, but I think doing this live and trying to find it would not probably be a good idea. So um, if you have any other questions, please let me know. Yeah, I don't think I will be able to find it with this. Okay. But that, it's somewhere. There's an example. I can find it later for you if you want. Yes. Yes. There's there's a question. Ah. I thought. Yes. So one way I like to describe Ray is I say to people it's a cloud native Hadoop, <laughs> literally uh, with YAML, yes. Um, so, like I mean, Ray, the core library of Ray has the scheduling logic. So, so, so it is basically up to Ray to decide where the jobs will run depending on which worker node is available, but also depending on which constraints you give the job when you're running it. So if you say I want a GPU, it will literally go run it on a node with a GPU. Right, so that's why I said it's it's Ray is the orchestration layer for uh, for workloads, and then Kubernetes is the orchestration layer for the Ray cluster itself. Right, but yeah, it's it's the scheduler inside Ray that will decide where the workloads will run. Essentially, makes sense. Any other questions? Yes. No, 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 no. Just like a just a, a terminology. Just Ray decided to call, call them actors. That's a very good question. Uh, if you would instantiate an actor, that would be just an instance. You can instantiate multiple actors. Um, so you can run multiple replicas of the same actors if you have to act on different types of data. Um, but but I, I'm not very familiar with the Java side of things, so I cannot compare them. So that's, that's, that's why. In terms of persistent, the state of the actor itself is not persistent. 
But if you have data that you're acting on, then you can persist that after the execution, right? I am not very familiar with that part, so I don't know. Uh, I think that there is some integration between them, but I am not super familiar with the integration between Kubeflow and Ray. So, but Kubeflow, I think, is only for TensorFlow. Yeah, but like specifically for TensorFlow, right? To be able to run the TensorFlow framework under the hood. Uh, sorry? You can run PyTorch as well? I, well, I mean, Kubeflow is written in Python, no? Kubeflow is written in Python. It's Go? Okay. Sorry? Yeah? So you could potentially use Kubeflow to write a pipeline that runs on top of Ray, essentially. That's what you're saying. Or the other way. I have no idea. <laughs> Sorry. I could probably cut up. There is another question here in the front. No? Okay, well, thank you very much. Thanks for coming to my talk.